Tonight I'm going to try and demonstrate how important information technology, technology is to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, oh, and, um, and I want to uh, talk, I suppose, subtly argue that indigenising the internet will actually ensure that we actually, um, ab more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will connect with information technology. It's not very, uh, uh, you know, one of the challenges I have when I talk about STEM or information technology particularly is a lot of our mobs say, well, it's not our culture. And I said, well, I think you're probably not right, actually. <laughs> I think we can actually be a part of this, and I'll, and I'll argue why in a minute. First, I want to share a couple of slides. Um, and I always do that, and a lot of Aboriginal presenters do do that. Um, and uh, what I want to do is show you some uh, slides of photos and some of those important historical moments in my life, if you like. So non-Indigenous people often ask me, how, um, how am I different to them? I mean, they look at me and go, okay, you're a successful academic. You have the most senior Indigenous academic role in the ACT. Um, and you've, you're a professor of IT. So, you know, obviously you've made it. And it's been quite easy for you. And, and I think nothing could be more from the truth. <laughs> Nothing could be more from the truth. <coughs> when they ask me that question, I'll say, they I'm different is I'm Aboriginal. And they're very perplexed about that. OK, they're very perplexed. So how are you different? Well, I often think about identity. And Paul Collis walked in a little while ago. And we had a chat today. Um, he just finished his PhD, Paul, uh, here at the University of Canberra. will graduate very soon. So congratulations on that, bro. Um, but Paul, Paul and I had a chat today about the social construction of Aboriginality and identity. And I think that's exactly what it is. But not necessarily created by us, but created by the non-Indigenous community in some way. And I'll show you that in a sec. So in year 10, I finished year 10. I didn't go to year 12. I only went to year 10. Thank goodness for the foundation program at the University of Canberra. Otherwise, I would never have gotten to here where I am. I uh, finished year 10. And, uh, and then year 10, you actually pass around a, a, uh, a book, you know, a yearbook. And people will write lovely, positive comments about congratulations, well done, lovely to see you, good luck for the future, and that sort of thing, right? And that's what happens. Except one person wrote this on mine. Just one comment. I'm not going to repeat what it says. You can read it. Just one comment. So how we're constructed is not necessarily from our perspective, but from the non-Indigenous community's perspective. And this is how I'm different in year 10. And I'm sure it's no different to any other Aboriginal person in the room, to be quite honest. So that's that bit. I want to show you two other images, two other profoundly influential impact images uh, that changed my life and my family's life. The first one on the left-hand side uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to use this, sorry guys, on this side of the room, I'm going to use over here. And it's a lovely, um, University of Canberra's always done media so good, and I really appreciate that, always has. Uh, so this is in the Canberra Times, former mechanic gets dream degree, and that's true. I spent the first 11 years of my life um, being a motor mechanic. It was the most amazing job I've ever had. Uh, and if, if, if you're wondering, yes, yes, I still do oil changes, and yes, people still do ask me to come and help and advise. And, uh, and um, there's other stories, but I can't I won't mention them today. <laughs> uh, but I'll do that. So that's me, a, a much younger me. Still not much hair, sadly. Oh, that's all right. Uh, yeah, the Ngunnawal sort of uh, graduation style that hangs very proudly at the front door of my house. Um, so every time I walk in there, it just reminds me um, of that achievement, because that was really a profound influence. Um, if you can't see very well, but that's most of my children and my wife down there. Not all of them were born at this time, only four of them were. Um, the, second, the second image I want to show you, which was another profound um, impact on me, was the graduation, my graduation at the uh, ANU where I did my PhD. And the reason why that's quite significant is because um, my PhD was a little bit controversial, go figure, go figure. Um, I decided to actually research Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander use of information technology and come up with a new model of, of diffusion theory. The idea of when we take things up or adopt things, or we, we actually, uh, there's a sort of general theory of diffusion, diffusion of, uh, of innovations. 
So I come up with a new model called the Indigenous Household Adoption Model, and it's a bit controversial. So what we did, um, what my supervisor did, said, what, what I'll do is rather than actually have this debate, I'll actually send your PhD to two international uh, two examiners. I'm not sure how common that is, but it was fairly uncommon back then as well. Um, mind you, it was only not that long ago, actually. I'll tell you in a second how long ago it was. Because um, Gareth Evans is still the, vice cha um, the chancellor there. So two examiners, international examiners, um, to make sure that what I'd done, even though it was fairly controversial, um, would be underscored forever by two senior academics in the field. And the way it went, went off, and yeah, everyone has that nervous wait with a PhD, thinking, is it good enough? Will it come back? And everyone said to me, it's OK. It's going to come back with corrections, but that's fine. You'll get through. You'll get through. Um, but it came back with absolutely a lot of suggestions, but no corrections, and it went through without any correction at all, um, which is just fabulous, which is just fabulous. And at that point, um, Professor Mandy Thomas, who was the PVC for research, told me that only about 5% of PhDs get through without any correction at all. And I thought, well, that's pretty solid ground. Thank you. I've been in this space for a very long time. Uh, when I say a very long time, it's nearly 20 years now. My PhD, I completed um, in July this year. My, I'll, I'll, I'll be officially no longer an early career researcher, sadly. And so it's only been not quite five years since I finished my PhD. Um, and I've had a great time along the way. So what I try to understand is what is, what is the digital divide? How can we actually look at digital divide and what's it really mean? Once upon a time, the digital divide only meant access to the technology. But now we know that's really only one tiny little bit. You can give someone access to something, but actually there's more to it. So we know that the digital divide really is about the gap um, in the ability to use information technology. It's the gap in the actual use of information technology, how, how often do you use it? And the other one is the gap of the impact of use. And now the impact of use is really important. The impact of use is really important. Ensuring, and this is the other component I suppose that's come a little bit later on as we start thinking about what the use is, ensuring that individuals are able to make smart use of ICTs um, when they feel it's appropriate. And sometimes, and let me tell you, I see, you know, I see a lot of interesting posts on Facebook, sometimes no use is smart use. Uh, that's the truth. So what I did, so initially, everyone said to me, the reason why Aboriginal people don't use information technology is because there is no infrastructure in a lot of remote or very remote Aboriginal communities. And I thought, that's a really interesting idea. But what? What I did, because I, th I believed him, by the way, wasn't until I went and looked at the um, ABS data, the Australian Bureau of Statistics data, on internet connections, did I actually discover something interesting. Because what I discovered was that no matter where Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal people live, and this is 2006 data, by the way, I'll show you the updated data in a minute, not a, no matter where non-Aboriginal people live, they had more then 60% of the population had access or an internet connection, regardless of ge geography. But what was really sad was only about 5% of Aboriginal households in remote communities actually had an internet connection. So that says to me that geography doesn't make a difference. It's no difference at all. The infrastructure's there. The reality is because, and I've seen this firsthand. I mean, I've spent, to, I spent a lot of time, I spent three months living with my poor family. I spent three months living at Murajulu, um, while I did my field work and didn't come home once. And I think my youngest boy was about three months old when I left, and he was six months old when I got home anyway. He didn't know me who I was. So. But in that community, it was true. Five Aboriginal households had internet connections, not one, uh, sorry, five non-Indigenous households, the only five non-Indigenous households had internet connection, and, and not one Aboriginal household in that community at that time uh, actually had an inter internet connection at all. So. It showed me that there was different factors, different factors. Fast forward in 2011 census, you can see a marked increase in access in, in number of internet connections. Still, and I still argue that even these areas are absolutely terrible. They're outer regional. And outer regional is like Darwin, um, uh, Tamworth, um, Dubbo, those areas. They're outer regional. Remote and very remote are still very, 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 very low uses of information, access to information technology. Now, the downside to this, 
I mean, everyone says how wonderful this is. This is terrible. The downside to this is that the government pours all its time trying to put services online, saying that we'll address the Aboriginal issue. We'll actually we'll put everything online. Well, if you do that, at most, in remote communities, at most, at most, in very remote communities, you're only going to get about 38% of the population, at the very most. Nationally, I think it's only, when you added up all this, nationally, it's only a 60% of the indigenous community nationally has a broadband connection at home. Now, the broadband connection, everyone says, what about mobile phones? That's a really good question. Who's ever tried to tap out a job application on a mobile phone? Who's ever tried to access Centrelink on a mobile phone with your 400 million, dollar digi 400 million digits that you have to put in and your authentication over a 3G connection? 3G is so slow. Try to do your authentication over a 3G connection, accessing Centrelink with these, one of these things. Even, in, even right here, right now, would be difficult, let alone remote communities. So my view, this is great for social media and checking your bank balance, but pretty useless for anything associated with the digital economy. Not in all cases, but mostly. So if I overlay the two, you can see that there's been a bit of an improvement over time. There's been a bit of an improvement over time. So what my research discovered, what, my, what I found during my lovely time out bush uh, in, in Canberra and also in Taree, was that there are four really main factors that drive the adoption of information technology in Aboriginal households. Four really primary factors. And I thought this is really interesting, because this is often when you do research, you go, oh, duh, it's just normal. We, we know it research. Sometimes you just do research to prove something. What I discovered here was really interesting. So the use of, the use of ICTs in employment is a very big driver of the adoption of information technology in the home. And that's because, it's not, well, it's not really. It's not really because your boss wants you to do emails at night. Except, you know, that might be the case. I know I, it's a bit of a tension in my house. <laughs> um, but it's not because of that. It's because what happens is you develop these wonderful ICT skills. You develop these skills, and it becomes a part of what we call your habitus, your everyday way of living and the way of doing things, and you bring that into the household. And then there's somehow that's a, sort of an extrinsic or intrinsic motivation to actually adopt the technology because you can see the value of it. I mean, I know, and I'm not going to ask anyone in here, but I know a, lot of, I know a number of Aboriginal people who actually don't have internet connection at home um, will actually do their job applications at work. And if they had connections at home, it would be very different. So I'm going to, I'll touch on that a little bit later on. The use of ICTs in education as adults is another big driver. One of the challenges for actually any sort of education is actually having access to the internet. And that drives, that drives the technology, the use of technology. Who, who's got time at work to actually sit down and uh, nut out an essay? And so it makes sense that you'll actually have information and technology at home. These are the four primary. If you, if you want a larger, nuanced discussion, you can, there's 400 odd pages of a PhD somewhere that you can look at. Um, but these are really the, um, the primary factors. Having family and friends with ICTs is another really important factor, and, this, and particularly in the Aboriginal community. Everyone wants to know what everyone else is doing. So, yeah, so. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> and it's very much the truth. Um, so having family and friends, and it's a big driver. Because if you don't know what's going on, well, you're out of the loop. You need to be in, you need to be in that loop. You know, what, you know what cousins and aunties are up to. You need to know. The other thing that I found really interesting, and I'm not sure if this is for all, I mean, I'd love to go back and do some non-Indigenous research in this space. But what's really interesting is having school-aged children, it seems like a life cycle effect. So if, you, if I ask in this, quest, in this room, and it may, Canberra's a little bit different to other parts of the country. But, so if you have, by and large, if you have a, um, a, a primary school child, you're likely to have a computer. But if you have a, a, a high school child, you're likely to have a computer and the internet at home. It's really interesting how that, so you have this sort of life cycle effect thing. So they're the primary drivers, I suppose, of information and communication technology. <coughs> now I want to just switch a little bit this is something I find incredibly um, interesting. And I've touched base with a couple of the federal members on this, on this point. We have, under the, um, under the legislation, we have a thing called USO, Universal Service Obligation, okay? Where you can actually have, you can have an internet connection, or sorry, a phone connection anywhere where you live. That's a Universal Service Obligation for digital. Then there's a Digital Data Service Obligation, the DDSO. 
the digital data service obligation, which gives you sort of a minimum standard of internet connection, which really isn't that great. Um, but at least you have some sort of um, legislation or um, administrative support to actually have an internet and phone connection, regardless of where you live in the country. But one thing that I picked up with the NBN, when the NBN came in, the USO had changed considerably, and they come up with this new, new organization called the Telecommunications Universal Service Management Agency, or TUSMA. And what they've done, and I think this is absolutely horrendous, what they've done is define what a community is. They said, TUSMA ensures all Australians have reasonable access to a digital data service and telecommunications, providing that the community has a population base of more than 50 people. So really, the telecommunications industry, the telecommunications legislation defines what a viable community is. How many Aboriginal communities are less than 50 people? Anyone that's travelled remotely will know that there's quite a few <coughs> communities with less than 50 people. So the downside of this is having access, you know, and, it's, and it's, it's always the way, where the most impact of the technology can be and have the biggest impact is where the technology is. And, and then we have legislation to make sure that that's the case. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <coughs> However, and they qualify this, because they say, well, the NBM will give you access to everything you want. Anyway, it's really interesting that. It's really interesting. But I'm really worried about this. That, that actually has written into legislation to say what defines a viable community is more than 50 people. All right. Let's have a chat about some benefits of the internet. This is the really exciting stuff. The benefits of the internet. So, what, a, what the internet can do very, very good is lower the transaction cost. Now, what, what, by that mean, by that, what I mean is a, a good example is going to the bank. Okay, so we go to the bank. Uh, to go to the bank from home, you've got to jump in the car, you drive over, someone, you've got to park, you've got to get out, and you've got to go to the counter and they stamp it, whatever they do, um, charge you $5 for doing that these days, I think. Um, but they lower the transaction costs. You can do this all this on online. If you're lucky enough to live in Canberra, you can actually pay $60 for unlimited internet. If you're unlucky like us who live in about 45 minutes from here, you've got to pay $100 for, for 500 gigs of internet at 20 megabits per second, um, which is really expensive uh, comparatively. But the transaction cost comes down, not just for the consumer, but for the business. And you'll see banks do this very, very well. They do it very, very well, transaction costs. Scheduling of appointments, making doctor's appointments, very easy to do uh, online. Access health. Man, who hasn't used Dr. Google? Seriously. Every time you get an x-ray back or some report back or a blood test, you're all Googling and see what are you going to die of? <laughs> Why do we do that? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And it's never, it's never that bad because you think, you, you know, when you walk into the doctor and say, I, it's OK, I know exactly what's wrong. And he goes, no, it's not that at all. Anyway. Um, so access to health, and that's really important, especially with the e-health report, the e-health card, the e-health um, uh, portal. And that's really important because if you travel from one community to another, and particularly, you know, and we're, you know, some of our mob are pretty transient. I've been back and forth a bit, a bit myself. Um, you know, it's really frustrating not having access to your health records. It really is. And I, I found that um, when I've traveled, um, education is really important. All universities and TAFEs are moving towards online education. If you don't have an internet connection, man, how are you going to get educated? It makes no sense. Um, better civic engagement. This is really cool. Yeah, MyGov. Anyone use the MyGov portal? Okay. Once you, once you actually crack it, it's quite good. <laughs> it's quite good. Cracking it's really hard. Yeah. You know, you, and I know why, you know, everyone tells me why, but gee, anyway. Um, being better informed, more informed, so constitutional recognition of indigenous peoples, it's a really good example of that right now. Um, there's a very strong social media, a very strong social media campaign for anti-recognize, anti, -recognize, anti I mean, a lot of non-indigenous people would probably be surprised about this actually, <laughs> that there's a, there's a huge number of Aboriginal people who think recognize, recognition is not the way to go. And there's lots of debate in, the med in social media about that. So those who are excluded from that have to make up their own mind, sadly. You can't have a discussion about it. Um, one thing that's really interesting, 
is if you have access to the internet, you get better jobs, you get better pay. We know that. What we don't know really from research is that we don't know if it's you get the job first or the, or the pay first and sort of this cyclic sort of area, but it's true. Those who have access to the internet at home have better jobs and better incomes. It's just a fact. Um, maintaining contact with family and friends, and that's very, very important, incredibly important. And this other thing here about emotional and social well-being. And I think that's something um, that's really, really important. Emotional and social well-being, I'll touch, I'll touch base on that just a little bit more uh, in a couple of slides time. So I got this slide the other day off LinkedIn. I just knocked it off from LinkedIn. It's credited. Don't worry, it's OK. I kept the little, <laughs> I didn't make it up. Um, but 60 seconds on the internet, what does it look like? What does 60 seconds on the internet look like? Um, 38,000 um, Instagram posts. This is 60 seconds. 2.78 uh, million views on YouTube. Uh, 2.4 million. And I love this. I mean, this is just an observation. And this is sort of digressing a little bit, but what's really interesting, I've watched my children grow up with IT, right? So we've got broadband to the bedroom. It's okay. okay. They've got good software that they can't see the wrong things. It's okay. They'll tell you too how much of a pain it is when the internet goes off at 9.30 so on, on, on school nights. They'll tell you. Um, but what's interesting, I watch them grow up, and the older boys, I've got five boys and a daughter, second youngest is a daughter, so, so the older children, um, the two oldest ones, we use Google quite a bit. It's really interesting. But they've transitioned now. The younger ones, they'll do all their searching in YouTube. They don't want text anymore. They want a rich content. You know, that's how come I had to go from 200 gig to 500 gig a month. Um, so it's really interesting what happens in 60 seconds, 60 seconds on the internet. Now, I want to get to the point, I suppose, about what I'm, my view of the world in terms of what I think is pretty cool. There's one piece of research, only one, so I don't know how, you know, we can't say it's officially solid yet. You've got to do some more research to find out. There's one piece of research that says Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 20% more likely to actually have, um, to use social media. And let me tell you, that's probably true, actually, you know. Most of my friends on Facebook, it might probably make sense, are, are, are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. And man, they post a lot. Man, they've got a lot to say. <laughs> Isn't that right? There's a few. Isn't that right? We've all got a lot to say. Um, that's true. But what we do have, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to just go over to the, my computer in a minute and I'll show you a couple of spots, um, a, a website. But Indigenous X. Um, Indigenous Excellence Twitter handle, Luke Pearson, uh, one of our associate uh, professionals here at the university, um, actually created the world's second rotating Twitter handle. It's really interesting. There's another guy in Sweden that created the first rotating Twitter handle. Now, rotating doesn't mean it spins around. I mean, you could think about that. But what it means is that everybody, each week, another Aboriginal person gets access to, this, uh, to the Twitter account and actually tweets out stuff that's important to them. And this is about, I suppose, creating an Aboriginal space or creating, opening up the conversation about what is Aboriginal culture, what is Aboriginal identity, and what are the important issues to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and what's really interesting, and I'll, I'll show you in a second a couple of things. Um, Luke has done some amazing work, and I really, you know, he is um, really a social, innovation, a social innovator beyond um, probably, you know, he's probably well before his time in many ways, I think. Uh, and it, it will, we'll come to realize just how um, much of an impact he's had, not just nationally, but internationally as well. Um, if anyone's met him, he is an incredible man with huge amounts of energy, very entrepreneurial, and yes, um, I'm sure some of us have met him more than once. Um, he's an amazing man. So what he did with his Twitter handle, he uses it for good sometimes. He uses it for good all the time. Um, so you remember a couple of years ago, there was a, there was a um, Australia Day established 1788 campaign. You know, Australia established in 1788. So Luke said, this is not on. So he started tweeting out, uh, you know, Australia wasn't founded, I mean, it wasn't lost. I mean, it didn't start in 1788, Australia. I mean, we don't know when it started, but a long time ago. It wasn't 1788. And as a result, you'll see all the retailers removed all their merchandise that had 1788 on it. Luke started that. There's lots of other people got on the bandwagon as well, but Luke was the one who initiated that. 
Luke has raised many hundreds of thousands of dollars for charities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander charities around the country. He's got, one, got a campaign going now, so you should check out Indigenous Ed. Um, he's got a connection to the Guardian newspaper, which is just amazing. So the Guardian newspaper has carved out a little Aboriginal space in their, in their newspaper. And he's also just finishing up um, 20 Indigenous authors, and yours truly is one of them, thank goodness. Um, um, an anthology on Indigenous excellence and what that looks, for, looks like for us. He's also gone. Anyone, got a, anyone want to have a stab at that, what that means? Indigenous XCA, where is that? What country? Canada, yeah. So actually, so now he's franchised this into Canada and it's worked out very well. So I'm going to duck, duck over here. There's a website that's associated with this. And I hope that this works. If not, that's okay. And you see that there's actually what we call a carved out indigenous space. It's a very unique indigenous space. Every single uh, uh, person who's had access or been the rotated Twitter handle, the, the holder of the Twitter handle, is actually up here um, since a few years back. You see Nova Paris, of course, um, and others. And, and Dr. Burke, have you been a, you've been a, yes, true, yes. I'm just trying to, I wonder what year was that, um, do, uh, Dr. Burke? January this year, let's have a look and see where, um, where that is. And uh, what's really cool, uh, you can see some really amazing people, um, Bronwyn Carlson, um, Andy Saunders, incredible people. So where are you, Chris? Are oh, here we are. Okay, so look, and, and that is, so as part of this is actually get to know someone. So you're carving out a space. So we're carving out a space and some of, the, some of the photos that uh, Chris was a part of, uh, Dr. Um, Burke was a part of, is at that particular point in time. Um, and I've gone to the next one. So it's carving out an indigenous space, a purely Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space. This is an exciting thing. This is what I call indigenizing the internet. This is educating the masses. Who, if you want to know anything about anything Aboriginal, indigenous sex is a great starting point. I'm going to actually uh, talk about two Facebook pages now which I think are absolutely amazing. And some of you guys, some of the people in the audience will, will, will uh, recognize this. So the first one is the Gomorrah Mums and Buds program, based in Tamworth, in a place called Timinda, which is the Tamworth industrial area, in a huge shed, un, un, unassuming shed. Um, this program is the world's largest mums, Aboriginal Mums and Bubs program. The idea of the program is, a, is an arts program. Mums will do the uh, a cast and they'll paint their, their cast. Um, and it's an arts program. But attached to that arts program is actually a very important program. So they have an ultrasound, um, that they'll take blood, and they'll um, have a diabetes or a dietitian. So it's all, the arts program is based 100% around um, health. But what I find interesting is actually they were having huge trouble connecting with the mums, staying connected to mums all the time, huge trouble. So they come up with a really good idea. Someone said, let's try Facebook. And so they did. They tried Facebook. Why is Facebook much better to stay connected than a mobile phone? Anyone know an idea? Anyone? This is probably a very Aboriginal thing. But in a lot of Aboriginal communities, does this stay together with one person? Does one person access this thing? No, it's actually shared across three or four people, okay? So if, you, if someone's sending a text message about coming to the, the diabetes clinic or the ultrasound, how do they connect? They connect through Facebook, a personal message through Facebook. And Kim Ray is the person, Dr. Kim Ray, um, is the person who runs this out of the University of Newcastle. Um, and their personal messaging is amazing. And what they've also done is actually put on, put on a, a, a nutrition app onto the program, onto their mobile phones, and ask the mums to actually, and for the bubs as well, but for the mums particularly, if they can just monitor their nutrition. Okay, and that goes back to a server as well. So this is an incredible thing. So Facebook here is used not only to stay connected to mums and bubs in this program, but also it has serious health, practical health impacts on everyday mums and bubs. This is awesome. This is amazing. And if you can see that in practice, if anyone has an opportunity to go and have a look at that program. I'm sure Kim will be um, welcoming with open arms. And she always does. She's amazing. The second one um, I want to pick on um, is 
the Queen being deadly runners. Anyone besides the Queen being deadly runners in the room? Has anyone else heard about the Queen being deadly runners? Fabulous. That is awesome. It is incredible. It is absolutely amazing. Again, this has serious health benefits. Because you see, when I came back to, from Newcastle recently, yours truly, <laughs> and, and son, uh, son number, I don't know, what number are you again? <laughs> Uh, my son number four uh, joined me as well, and, and, and also son number two has joined me too now. So. But it has serious health benefits, serious health benefits. It, we all are staying fit, as, as one of us was chatting the other day. At least we're doing it, right? At least we're doing it. Um, we're not, man, I'm not a runner by any means. But three days a week, I haven't got to the fourth day a week yet. The more dedicated are running on a Sunday as well now. Um, three days a week, we get up at a ridiculous hour in the morning and, uh, and go, it's often dark, this is obviously before, <laughs> before winter, <laughs> um, and we run in the dark together three, uh, at three days a week, a group of us, up to 60, I mean, it can be very big. But this is, and so this is really interesting, because this is the Queen Bean Deadly Runners open page, there's another closed page, and if you miss a session, oh man, you feel obliged to actually go off and run with your mobile phone, you've got to take a couple of photos and your little running app, and you've got to prove that you've done it. <laughs> Otherwise, you're in trouble. Uh, no, it's a really supportive program. And I think, you know, something, and, and, and hats off, you know, this is obviously a part of the IMF, the Indigenous Marathon Foundation's component. Uh, Georgia is actually, Georgia Gleason, um, some of you guys might know, is a local hero in many ways. <laughs> Amazing story. She's actually the coordinator of it. Um, I actually ran because... I uh, actually joined, to be quite honest, I joined because one of my senior colleagues um, runs, and I didn't, if thought, she can, I can't. Um, you'll notice mostly women, sadly, in some ways, well, that might be good, depending on how you look at the world. Uh, um, there's probably four or five blokes, and I think that's a really indictment on the blokes. The blokes are probably the unhealthiest ones, but anyway, you can't, you know. But I did say, the other day I had uh, met up with a couple of guys who were doing the, the Canberra Deadly Runners, which just started recently, um, and they said, well, I saw you got you doing it, so I thought I would do it as well, and that's a great impact. And I think that's something, and it's, it's the most supportive, I mean, I, uh, there's a lot of posts, let me say that, but it's a really supportive environment. These are really, really interesting aspects of what I call indigenizing the internet. We've carved out a really unique space for ourselves. We're in total control of that, and we're doing something practical to keep ourselves healthy, and we're, we're trying to, you know, kick that stereotype that we don't do anything. I mean, we're up at... I mean, it's dark every morning. I get out of bed at 20 past five of the morning, three days a week to go do this. We all do. There's 60 of us. It's amazing. And social media has really driven that. If I didn't see those photos of my colleague, I would not have done this. I would never have done that. I want to talk about two other things. Um, that are, one's a real benefit of social media. The other one's, the detriment of social media in many ways. Mediating tragedy. One of my colleagues, Bronwyn Carlson, I'll show you a picture of her earlier, she does a lot of work in the social media space about how do Aboriginal people use social media and what for. Some, I think it was probably uh, five or six months ago, I was travelling back from Newcastle um, on the motorcycle. Yes, I'd love living dangerously. My lovely wife doesn't think it's a great idea, but that's all right. She lets me <laughs> run. Got a phone call from Luke and said, have you seen Twitter this morning? And I said, no, brother, I haven't seen it. And he said, so-and-so um, posted a message about suicide. And, and we were too far away for us to do anything. We, I mean, hundreds of, this person was hundreds of kilometres away. And I said, well, what can we do? And he said, well, I'll tweet it out and see if someone that lives closer to her can actually go see her. And it was a very stressful time when someone tries to commit suicide. It's a very stressful time. So, um, and someone did. Someone reached, Luke reached out to Twitter. Someone actually, with the address and there were all the details. And someone went and round, saw the person, and she had taken an overdose of drugs, and it was a very bad way. And they called the ambulance, and she was, thankfully, she's still with us and doing amazing now. That is a real problem. But social media, if it wasn't for social media, for her reaching out, and for us having that network to actually do that, would have been another death of an Aboriginal person a suicide that was, was um, a meaningless suicide again. 
So social media has a huge impact on actually making sure Aboriginal people stay alive. And that's that space I'm talking about in terms of indigenising, carving out that space to make sure that we're safe in that supportive environment. I went to a funeral in uh, Newcastle of the matriarch, um, a, a very senior matriarch of the Newcastle area. Um, I think it's probably 12 months ago now. And at the, at the service, and it, was, and it was a bit of a shock to me, at the service, uh, the priest said, or uh, the father said, um, the clergy said, look, and dare I say it, thank you everyone for coming, and dare I say it, and all the messages on Facebook. And I thought that was really interesting. I've never been to a funeral before where someone acknowledged all the messages and the condolence messages on Facebook. And I thought, this is really interesting. So the world's changing a little bit. The world's changing a little bit. So rather than go to the funeral, you can send a Facebook message and that's okay. I don't know. It's just things are changing a little bit. And of course, um, the downside of social media, of course, and I don't want to touch on this too much, but the downside is actually racism. There's a lot of racism. I'm not sure, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, someone had posted something horrendous like this on the right-hand side. And sorry about the quality of the image. It's the only one I could find with everything scrubbed out. You don't need to see the words. You've got an idea of what it means. Um, it, someone posted on my Facebook when I posted this, you know, it's, it, you know, um, you can, you know, they think there's a thing called freedom of speech and censorship's a slippery slope. And I said, well, if you think censorship's a slippery, slippery slope, then you should tell the government not to censor our internet. It's too late. It's too late. Uh, censorship's already there. And anyway, of course, you know what happened to that fella. Um, he's been charged with uh, racial vilification, and he'll be dealt with by the law, which is good. All right, let's say, let's change a little bit. Let's change things a little bit. I want to show you. And, it's, and I'm going, to, I'm going to give you, for the kids in the room, there's explicit language, um, warning. There's a word in here that you might be offended. Um, um, but this is a skit from Aboriginal comedy, black comedy, sorry, if you watch it on SBS. It's been on SBS. I don't know if that means anything. Um, but there is a warning here. Um, what if we indigenize? What if we indigenize technology? What if we, what if we had an Aboriginal help desk? Let's have a, let's have a watch this. Which way, Aboriginal IT solutions, this is the help desk. I have a problem with my computer that I can't seem to get it to work. What have you done to try and fix it? Well, I've rebooted it, I've tried Control-Alt-Delete. I've turned it off and on at the wall, then turned it back on again. Have you called it a slut? Come again? Have you sworn at it, mumbled under your breath, talked through your teeth and all of that? Well, no, will that work? Try it and see how it goes. All right. Come on, you slut. You need a bit more passion and emphasis on the slut. Come on, slut. Louder and blacker. Come on, you slut. I want you to close your eyes and think of 200 years of colonization. Think of Freedom Rides and Kathy Freeman running with that flag. Think I'm black and I'm proud. Here, come on, you slut. Louder, stronger. Come on, you slut. Oh, that's game and titter. Think about mob marching on the streets. Think of the tent of the the referendum. Think of John Howard. Come on, you slut! Oh, there you go. It's working. Thanks, help desk. No worries, my titter. Call back any time. But what's really, really interesting there, it, yeah, in terms of carving out that space on the internet, is that really interesting. So first, tackling an issue. I mean, that, that clip tackles an issue that we all face. Man, how many times do you have frustrated with a computer? It's really interesting. But what I really like is how he delves, like how he delves deeply into the aspects of Indigenous Australia to motivate her to, you know, and he says things like, um, think of 200 years of colonisation, think of the freedom rides, and of course the freedom rides were associated with racism and the horrendous um, human rights abuse that was going on in the 70s, um, led by Charlie Perkins, of course. Um, think of Kathy Freeman, one with a flag. Think of the think I'm black and proud. I love how and I love how she gets and says, you know, he goes, you gammon sit titter, and which that means gammon means um, false, fake, um, you know, rubbish. Someone else help me out with this. No, false, fake. Uh, and titter is just sister. It's just sister. So gammon titter, um, which is great. And then he goes on and says, um, 
You know, think of the flag. Think of the protest. Think of the mob marching in the streets. Think of the tent embassy. Think of the referendum. And then last he goes, think of John Howard. And that sort of tipped her over the point. And, ah! <laughs> Um, it's great because it delves into it, but it's really comedy is really really interesting. So it's really clever. It covers that clip really covers colonization, you know, the freedom rise of course, and then covers identity and, and the I suppose the continual struggle for recognition. Here's another one I want to touch base on. Man, I was watching the news the other day, and I saw something that was quite disturbing. It actually shocked me. I mean, I, you had these white people paint their face black and post it up on Facebook. And this got me really pissed because I was going to set up my own uh, social media network. That's right, I was going to call it Blackface Book. <laughs> <laughs> and I will do exactly the same over in New Zealand for my Maori brothers and sisters, and theirs will be called All Blacks Facebook. <laughs> and on my Blackface Book, there won't be no likes button, it'll only be gammon or deadly. <laughs> and on my black Facebook, there won't be no friends, just cousins. <laughs> and on my black Facebook, you won't get poked, just fingered. <laughs> That really, um, the black Facebook really touches on some really interesting things about racism <laughs> and uses, you know, gammon and really just opens up a real interesting dialogue. I love that. The black face book um, is really interesting. So carving out that space is really important. You know, no friends, just cousins. Because <laughs> we're all related. <laughs> we're all connected. Oh, that's so funny. Anyway. Yeah. So that's an interesting <laughs> way of thinking about the world. So bringing that sort of, I suppose, indigeneity, I suppose, into the digital space. All this stuff is online, by the way. It's freely available online. Of course, no talk is um, complete without talking about apps. Apps are very, very important. They've become very important. Uh, I want to touch base on this. Aunty Agnes is now gone. But if you actually download the Welcome to Country app, because it's, um, it's actually done on G G what's it called? geotagging. Um, you actually download that, welcome to country, Annie Agnes will pop up in a YouTube clip and give you an acknowledgement of country and talk about her culture. It's an amazing app. And it goes around every country around, the, around, the, around Australia. Um, the Aboriginal Sydney app is a very interesting app. Again, significant Aboriginal places around Sydney you can actually go, they're geotagged again. And it's about carving out that space, like I say. NACHO, Aboriginal, uh, the National Aboriginal Community Control Health Organisation, against with all, just all the information that's required there. Um, it's a really interesting one here, the uh, uh, language app. Um, it's a fairly recent language app from, um, uh, from Broome. If you're interested in understanding that mob's language, you can go and download this app and try to do your best. Um, what's really interesting is there's some challenges around um, major corporates and how they hold this Indigenous data, if you like. Not all of it's Indigenous data, but I think some of it is. That's some IP issues around that. That's another, that's another discussion. But what's really interesting is this top app up here is really interesting, Yarn. And it says here, unfortunately, this app is not currently available in the Australian iTunes store, but you can buy it in the United States. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's what they call geo-blocking. Um, anyone know about geo-blocking? You can get access to some things in this country and, um, and not access to other things. It's just crazy. Um, I've actually used this app extensively. It's a very, very good app. It talks about... It's an Aboriginal storybook, but it actually talks a lot about culture. Um, it's a very, very good, good app. And I thought, just to add an international dimension to this, you'll see this app on here. It's called 100 Years of Loss. It's a Canadian-based app, and it talks about um, what they call the residential school. It's very interesting. When I first went to Canada, I thought, yeah, residential school is what we do at university. Um, but, it, but it's got a very different term, a very different meaning in, the United, in Canada. Um, residential schools are really they're stolen generations. Um, those kids are actually, so all the First Nations, the Inuit and the Métis, were actually rounded up on, um, and put into residential schools because they were going to educate these, um, the natives, if you like. It's funny how the British tend to do the same thing, regardless of where they go. Uh, you know, it's very, very interesting. So anyway, so this, if you want to learn about some history, there's some really interesting Canadian history. I mean, there's mega amounts of apps. 
my gut feeling about all these apps is eventually they'll all disappear and be integrated into social media. They really, by themselves, they have very little, they have very little context. Anyone who's got a smartphone will got a million apps. How, many often, how often do you use them? How often do you use them? It's really interesting. So social media, my gut feeling is that they'll be integrated. They'll integrate into social media. It's the only way to go, otherwise I'll never use them again. What I um, move on, this is uh, a clip. Anyone know Minecraft? The world's biggest sandbox, right? The world's biggest sandbox game. Amazing. This is, these are internet-mediated games. Um, wouldn't be surprised to know that I asked my lovely children, I said to them, would you mind creating me an Aboriginal scene for me for tonight's presentation in Minecraft? And, uh, and to be quite honest, I wasn't aware, I know I pay, I pay for the internet and the computers and the Minecraft accounts, but I wasn't aware <laughs> of the complexity it would take to actually create this scene. So to create this scene, um, they had to do their own skins, they had to make their own skins using an app, which is cool. So they used an app and uploaded it to the Microsoft server. Uh, Mojang now is owned by Microsoft, you probably know that. Um, and they actually uploaded their own skins. And then to do this scene, I needed three Microsoft, uh, uh, three Minecraft accounts. Is that right, John? Three Minecraft accounts. And this here is looking through the eyes of Natasha's um, character or avatar. But this is interesting. So they've got a cave and a fire. But I think what I'm trying to get to here is I watch my children play this game. It's a world. And my boy, my eldest boy in, in, um, uh, my eldest boy in Brisbane, and I've seen my other son in Queanbeyan, when you open up, open up a couple of ports in the, in the um, router, you can actually, they all can play together in this, in this sandbox. This is fabulous. And they've created sort of an indigenous scene, if you like, what they interpret as an indigenous scene. I think that is the future of where we're going to go to in terms of gaming. I want to finish off tonight on another game. Another really invention, another invention, it's a couple of years old now, by an amazing guy who I'd, I'd known for a very long time, Brett Levy. Um, based out of Brisbane. He runs the National Indigenous Radio Service and does this as a part-time gig. This is what he loves. I'm going to show you, we'll just run through this clip. Since the dreaming, the original custodians of Orani, the Gadigal people, lived, fished, hunted, gathered, and celebrated Orani. Virtual Orani, the sacred tracks of the Gadigal, is an immersive heritage landscape. This immersive heritage tool presents the arts, culture, and heritage of the Gadigal people. It is a tool that shows what Sydney Cove was like before the arrival of the first fleet in 1788. The virtual Warani presents stories told by the custodians of Sydney and informed by historical records, original oil paintings, and the research from anthropologists and archaeologists. Navigate the virtual. Look. Listen and learn knowledge, passed down from generation to generation since time immemorial. This latest iteration uses advanced computer software and hardware technologies to provide a more realistic, immersive heritage experience. However, in this time we have embedded digital avatars, recorded oral histories, modelled more artefacts and accurately modelled landscapes and vegetation. We added interactive gaming to enable you to interact in new ways with this environment to gain a better appreciation of the special connection the Gadigal held for this land. Move your mouse to learn about bush food. Watch for the dingoes roaming. Find goanna sunning themselves on the rocks. Try to find possums in the tall gum trees. Sneak up on wallaby grazing. Walk the bush tracks along the beach and climb the rocky foreshore. Find a canoe called a navi by the Gadigal. Paddle your navi across the azure blue waters of the harbour. Find the camp. 
Listen and learn to stories about wood and stone. Listen to stories and ancient legends. Respect the old practices and ancient traditions that sustain the Gadigal. Amazing, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? All right, I've kept you far too long, and I just want to finish off. Um, if I can, I might kind of, kind of slide forward. So I reckon, in terms of indigenous digital space, there are three really important elements: culture, identity, and humour. There's nothing that we know better. If anyone knows any Aboriginal person, humour is the basis of everything. Even when the, the world's horrible and the, and the clouds are really grey and everything's falling to pieces. You've always got humour, and that's really important. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter, you're a great teacher, isn't he? Isn't it? <laughs> And that was interesting stuff. We will carry a lot of that about for the next few weeks. And it'll come back and come back and come back. I'll follow that up or I'll see this or I'll see if I can find it. And uh, thank you. Uh, so much that was new, so much that was interesting and so much that was well presented. And my final remarks are these, that when I was a kid in school in Armidale, New South Wales, Aboriginal people lived at the dump in humpies made of corrugated iron. And I'm talking, let's say, I'm talking about 1950s. No, I'm talking about 1950, so 66 years ago. What will it be like in another 66 years? I'll have to ask some of you young ones because I actually won't be here. But the, the change that we talk about is occurring, it's not only occurring all the time and it's occurring rapidly and it's occurring areas in areas which we don't have a handle on. I mean, I don't, I don't know a lot about IT. I'm, I'm a typewriter person who uses his very expensive Apple supercomputer as a typewriter because it's the best typewriter I ever had. And I, and I use it to send emails and I, do, and I go to Chef Google for recipes and, and uh, Google... How I lived without Google completely puzzles me. It's, it's <laughs> indispensable. So, and that's only how long ago? 15 yeah, years? That's right, 2007. Yeah. Yep. Not even, not even that. What our country is coming to over the next 30, 40, 50 years is fundamentally affected by technology. Uh, the things that people have in mind now that they're angry about or happy about will very likely pass and not, not be important to their children and their grandchildren. We, we live at a time, I think, in human history where things are changing faster than ever. And I think what you've given us tonight, Peter, is a fascinating insight to one very important part of that for our country. Thank you very much. <laughs>